Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I am Steve Arbaro with my colleague and co-host, executive producer, Mary Gamba. Mary, looking great today. Oh, thank you. So are you, Steve. I said we are two, even given our age, our respective age, we are two pretty good-looking middle-aged people. Why don't you not go there so quickly, especially since we have Max Leventhal, who's just way too young to be having being on with me. So listen, real quick, Mary, plug our sponsors because the sponsors are the fuel that allows us to do what we do. Go ahead, Mary, let's well, plug Well, pretty away. soon we're going to need two half hours on News 12 Plus to really thank uh, the way that they deserve all of our sponsors because we have so many great ones. Uh, so we have uh, New Jersey Sharing Network uh, is brand new on board, as is Seton Hall University and the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. So we're very happy to welcome them to our family. And then we have Gibbons PC, we have Prager Metis, Valley Bank, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. And by the way, when we talk about the New Jersey Sharing Network, we're going to plug away for them because they are one of the nation's leading organizations when it comes to organ and tissue donation. They're a great organization. Uh, Joe Roth and Elise Glennon, the two leaders, they are great friends. So we're very proud to have them on board. And the folks at Seton Hall, where I've been teaching for the last few years at their Leadership Institute, the Bucino Leadership Institute, great academic institution on board. So it is our honor and pleasure to introduce a young man who... Uh, is a strong leader and has a big portfolio. He is Max Leventhal, Director of Business Development at another place where we have great friends, Fedway Associates. How you doing, Max? Good, how about yourself? Doing all right. Hey, Max, tell everyone what Fedway is, a great organization. Sure, uh, Fedway is uh, arguably the largest single state wholesaler uh, in the country. We distribute wines and spirits throughout the state of New Jersey. Um, we've been here uh, since you know, the end of uh, repeal and at the end of prohibition. My father acquired the company in uh, 1978, and we've uh, been a sole uh, family-owned wholesaler in the state ever since then. Yeah, your, your dad, Rich, is, is talk about a great leader and innovator with a terrific team there. Um, let, let me ask you this. Disruption, right? A big part of leadership. Hurricane Sandy hit. We'll talk about COVID in a second, but Hurricane Sandy hit back in 2012. Talk about disruption and having to pivot. Describe the challenge for Fedway and the leadership it took on that whole, for that whole team to get through that. Absolutely. So uh, October 2012, Superstorm Sandy came barreling up the coast of uh, the Atlantic Ocean and we took a direct hit. Um, we, we really uh, were in the crosshairs of the storm where both the Hackensack and the Passaic River merged twice uh, over the course of two uh, high tides during the storm. So where we were in Kearney, New Jersey, um, we were at the epicenter of it all. We took in uh, two 16 foot, foot uh, storm surges and it wiped out every single case, every single order picker, every single truck, um, all the conveyor systems. Um, luckily, our IT team had to actually disassembled our server network and brought it to higher ground. So that was the one saving grace. But with that, you know, this was coming at the end of October, run, running right into our busiest time of year where the consumption of uh, beverage alcohol is at its peak. So our warehouse was uh, filled to the gills, if you will, and we lost every single case. And we wound up uh, filing the largest single um, insurance claim in the state after the storm. But with that, um, you know, we came out of it stronger. We were uh, back up and running shipping just about two and a half weeks after the storm. And we did this under our own power, our own fuel. We brought in, uh, you know, trucks from out of state. We had to, you know, have our supplier partners who were, who were incredible along the way, redirect goods. Um, remember, they had loaded up all their other wholesalers across the country. Sure. But, uh, you know, they saw the, you know, what we had gone through and had prioritized goods for our, you know, our state and our wholesaler. And throughout, you know, this entire thing, we had the cooperation of our entire uh, workforce, you know, salespeople, truck drivers, uh, you name it, clerical staff, they were called in to do everything from drying cash, drying checks, to, you know, power washing the facility and receiving goods. So, you know, this was a uh, seven by 24 operation, three shifts a day, very military style, getting to, you know, put Humpty Dumpty back together. Let me ask you something. When the COVID crisis hits, we're taping this uh, um, actually early December of 2020. It'll be seen after that. When it hits in, in March of 2020 of this year as we're taping this. How much of the experience in Sandy for you and your dad and um, Rob Sansone and, and Neil at the time 
other friends there. How much of the experience in Sandy was helpful to pivot and deal with what you had to do for COVID or to totally apples and oranges? Which one is it? You know, I, I think Sandy was an event uh, that for the folks that were here was a, um, a pinnacle moment for everyone to rise up. And it really instilled the, the culture of what we call the Fedway family. And so everyone came together, um, didn't matter who they were, the title, position, what department they were, and they came together for the greater organization. And I think you saw a lot of that resurface uh, during the early days of uh, the pandemic where we had merchandisers, sales folks, uh, brand managers, you know, going out on delivery trucks, going out in the warehouse, picking bottles, picking cases, uh, and doing things that weren't or, or not in their uh, job description. Yeah, and playing out of position, as I like to say. They were playing yeah, out of position. Right. We, we took third baseman, we put them behind the plate. We took, you know, guys out of the bullpen and put them in left field. So we have a very malleable workforce, um, right. a very committed workforce that says, you know, whatever it takes, I'm in. And, you know, these are folks that are, you know, in, in their later years and they're committed to working in the warehouse during, uh, you know, a, a night shift from 11 o'clock in the evening to six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, they're happy to come in and do what it takes. And, uh, and and make you know this this, this operation hum. It takes your whole team. By the way, it's always great to be doing a live show with your uh, when your phone goes off. <laughs> you know, so you know it's live. We're, we're, we're yeah, doing you know, a live. No, we're Steve. live to tape. We don't want to edit anything out. I said, oh, "Hey, Mary, <laughs> jump in." That was a cute. That was actually your father calling Mary and saying. Mary's not getting enough air Yeah, time. exactly. That was right Bill here. Deering. Yes, our, our he, he biggest said, get fan. get Mary on the show. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, in. he watches us. I, I love it. Every Sunday he watches and then he writes notes. I love it. So thank you, Dad. He, he and, texted me and said, all right. You all stop right, stop talking. talking. You You're uh, sucking the wind ahead, out of the room. So, uh, so Max, you talked a lot about the Fedway culture, which is apparent, but when something like COVID happens and with Hurricane Sandy, there had to have been a lot of fear. How do you give your team the tools, the support that they need to really overcome that human fear and then come together? Because I'm sure there were a lot of people that said, I'm not leaving my house. They say we have to quarantine. How did you make your uh, team feel safe and know that you were there to keep them safe? Sure. Um, it's all about communication and, uh, you know, reinsuring that we're going to be all right and taking the fear, addressing it head on and saying, listen, we don't know, uh, you know, how far we have to bridge to get to the other side, um, but we're going to be with you throughout this entire thing. And so immediately on day one, um, you know, we were unsure whether or not we were going to be deemed an essential employer. So um, we didn't know if we're going to be in a work from home setting. We didn't know what the future held for us. But, uh, you know, we began coming up with various contingency plans from um, you know, ordering hundreds of laptops and provisioning them with the various software that everyone needed to continue to, to do their work. And I think that signaled to everyone that, you know, we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we want continuity. We want an orderly operation. And, you know, not only that, we have a, you know, a sales force that's 100% commissioned. And so for the folks that are calling on the bars and restaurants that were ordered to close, we had to come up with a plan to make everyone financially whole. We didn't want to lose our professional, you know, large, well-compensated sales force because of the pandemic. So we had to come up with a plan to ensure that, you know, these, these folks would be financially viable. And so you, you take that and the various technologies we implemented across you know, our facilities, whether it was, you know, a artificial intelligence facial recognition system to scan people into our facilities while also taking their temperature, having them stand, stand on a foot pedestal to um, remove 99.999% of all bacteria and viruses from their shoes, as well as a, um, a dry hydrogen peroxide system that cleans uh, all the ambient air and surfaces now in our warehouses and offices. So we believe that we took a you know, multi-faceted approach here to ensure that everyone felt safe coming to work. And not only that they felt safe, but that their families felt safe allowing them to go to work. And as it happened, we had some folks say to us, you know, over the weekends, can I bring my kids to the facility? To, you know, <laughs> clean them up right? I know you make it sound so great. I want to come there and, and get cleaned up. I'm always paranoid. I come home from like the store, I rip off my clothes. I'm like, I've got stuff all over me, germs everywhere. So I get it. Right. So I think we, we mitigated a lot of those fears and they're certainly still there. Yeah. Um, but sure. There very visible things and technologies we've implemented and deployed successfully. Um, and as a result, we don't have rampant outbreaks. I mean, 
we have hundreds of truck drivers and hundreds of salespeople going out into the marketplace with you know all the uh, PPE they need, and yet uh, you know our exposure to the virus you know has been very very moderate, and I think that's because we've been guided by the CDC and we've been taking those protocols very seriously, and we've overlaid you know substantial uh, technologies to mitigate all these risks. Hey Max, got about a minute left. Let me do this. First of all, there's a video. Can we marry in post production? Sylvester will put in the uh, Fedway website. Uh, the reason I'm saying that, Max, question. There's a video I know that Fedway has produced. Is it on the website as well, uh, the safety video? Yes, it is. Okay, so go on the Fedway website. We want you to see, because Max just described it really well, but the video goes even further than that. So check that out. Max, before I let you go, I'm curious about this. The last meeting Mary and I had in person, yeah, you're laughing, you know, was, <laughs> is that Fedway? The last in-person meeting that we had talking about leadership development was at Fedway. We're sitting around the conference room table wondering, hey, what's the deal with this thing? And then the world flips upside down. Here's the question. Does leadership development, developing your people to be the best leaders they can be, does it take a vacation during COVID? Absolutely not, no. Um, you know, this was a time for us to further empower our, our management team, to let them go out and continue their business, uh, to run their own business, if you will. You know, this was not a time for micromanagement. This was not a time for every single decision to be second guessed. This was all about empowering our leaders to go out and effectuate the businesses that they run. Uh, you know, we couldn't have implemented, you know, the various systems that I, I just described. We couldn't have, you know, facilitated, you know, an orderly business and, and never missed a shipping day if we had second guessed everything. We took the guidelines that were presented to us uh, by the CDC, apply them to our business, and move forward. Uh, you know, this was not a time to sort of reinvent the wheel and uh, and hunker down. We had to be very present, and ensure that we had an orderly an orderly business to run. Yeah. Hey, Max, do us a favor. Give our best to your dad, to Rich, to Rob, and to the entire team. And I will tell you, as a longtime friend and associate uh, connected with Fedway, Fedway is, by the way, one of the major underwriters of our, of our public broadcasting programming. Um, they're a great organization. They're generous and very supportive of an awful lot of not-for-profits, in addition to being a very successful bottom-line business. So, Max, to you and the Fedway family, as you said so eloquently, we wish you nothing but the best. Stay safe, be well, and I know you're keeping your employees safe as well. All the best, Max. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it, Mary. Talk soon. You got it. Mary and I will be back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Gibbons PC, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ On Air. C-I-A-N-J and Commerce Magazine. Valley's all about making life easier for clients. And that's why we're all about smiles too. So every day we make it possible for home buyers to become homeowners. For folks chasing their dreams to become entrepreneurs. For parents to plan today for their children's tomorrow. And for communities to get better every day. You see, when we know we've put a smile on a customer's face, well, that puts one on ours, too. Hey, welcome back, Lessons in Leadership. Mary, real quick, uh, before we uh, debrief on Max Leventhal, um, funders again, real quick. Sure, sure. So we've got Gibbons, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and then our two newest are Seton Hall University and the Bacino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, and then also New Jersey uh, Sharing Network, uh, who are doing just amazing yeah. work in organ and tissue donation. Yeah, real quick, when I think about Max, who, who actually we had a great meeting with, with his dad, Rich and Rob Sansone and others, um, one of the things I think about is that Max is a young man, clearly, that is going to have a bigger portfolio as he grows, as he gets older and more experienced. But growing up in an organization, which I did, where my dad was the leader and I was, you know, a kid growing up in it, 
That you didn't experience that, did you? I did not experience. My dad was uh, a welder and still is a welder and a shop supervisor. So I was interested in what he was doing, but it was definitely not my journey to follow in those shoes. But the legacy thing is always interesting to me, like having to grow to be a leader, but get out of the shadow while you respect your dad or whoever it is, mm -hmm. uh, your mom running an organization, you have to establish yourself. And, and Max is doing just that. He is. He is truly making his mark on the world. And as soon as we finished, we both said to each other, wow, you know, he, he's really got it. He's, you know, buttoned up. He was there to support his team, you know, during Hurricane Sandy and then also now with COVID. And, and just even hearing him, you can really tell that he's believable and just he's really doing a great job over there at Fedway. And the other thing is interesting, Max, uh, MBA candidate at um, University of Southern California, USC School of Business there, Marshall School of Business. I imagine that Max putting together his academic training around leadership and business and management mm -hmm. to, to having to deal with Hurricane Sandy. Oh, it's, you know, you could tell he's, he's really an underachiever. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're not, way, Max. That's just a joke. Um, the answer's not always in the book, right? But yeah, you put definitely. them together. It's a great combination. Hey, Mary, we're going to come back and talk about gratitude in just a minute. But um, talk about gratitude. Marie Bliston, who is, in fact, the president of the New Jersey Education Association, the teachers, well over 100,000 educators and others connected to the education um, profession are part of the NJA. We had a great conversation with Marie Bliston about leadership. We have great gratitude for our public school teachers. Mary has kids in the public schools. I do as well. So many others. We can't express our gratitude enough to those educators. So we're going to introduce Marie Bliston first and Mary and I talking more about gratitude, showing it and wanting it and needing it on the back end of this. This is Marie Bliston. Steve Adubato here talking all about leadership and innovation with our good friend Marie Bliston, who is the president of the NJA. We're taping beginning of November 2020. It'll be seen later. Hey, Marie, let me ask you something. I'm actually in the middle of trying to write a book with my colleague Mary Gamba about innovation. It's a follow-up to our Lessons in Leadership book, and it's called Lessons in Leadership, Innovation, and Disruption in the Age of COVID and Beyond. Now, forget about how long the title is. I'm thinking about how innovative teachers have to be to adapt and be effective in this incredibly difficult environment. What's the role of innovation in all this? Well, you know what? I think that's an excellent title for your book, by the way, and it couldn't be more timely in these times. So thank you for, for your efforts with that. I would say, Steve, that when we're looking at these times, uh, there's an old saying that emergencies or disasters are really the basis for inventions and innovation. And I found that to be true when we saw firsthand what our educators were able to do back in March and April, uh, being told with just a few days notice that they had to pack their things up, go home, and they were going to access their students through computers, trying to get them uh, trying to get computers into students' hands was just one of the problems, right? The other problem was taking lessons that we had perfected to deliver in person and somehow make them real and uh, realistic to the students right. through a modem that we're not really trained to use on an <laughs> everyday, everyday basis. And they did it. And they got better and better at it. And we got better in providing the supports that they needed. Our, our whole website, we had a whole section devoted to other links that they could access for free materials. Because some of our, our educators left the buildings and many of their materials were left back in the buildings. They thought they were gonna be out for two weeks, four weeks max. And as you remember, it was for the entire year. So they turned on a dime and I, I also think there's another old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And that's why our public schools are still ranked number one two years in a row, just saying. It's because our educators, they don't give up. And they have a relationship with their students that they're not going to let them give up either. Marie, let me play devil's advocate here. Because in our series, Lessons in Leadership, that I do with Mary Gamba every, every week on uh, News 12 Plus, every Sunday at 10. That's okay. I can plug. Um, I want to be clear on this. We're big on strategic planning. We talk about having a game plan. You, you, get the, you develop the game plan, you're strategic, and then you execute. So here's my question. For teachers who are clearly leaders, they are, they develop this game plan, this lesson plan. On, let's say, March 13th, February, March 13th, the pandemic implodes. 
world changes. What do you do with the lesson plans? What do you do with the game plans? And how do you then all of a sudden innovate as opposed to saying, why can't I just wait until things get better? Now you're shaking your head, why? Because we <laughs> don't wanna lose one minute, Steve. In our classroom, we, we plan and schedule from the time that school bell rings in the beginning of the day until it rings and those students are gone out the door and even then they have their assignments with them. We plan for every minute. We know that students learn at all different ways and at different time periods and we're human beings. Our brains shut on and they shut off various times. We as professionals cannot afford not to, not to be on our game 24 seven. And so when we had to switch from that in-person instruction to this virtual format, it did take a little bit of time, but not much time. They immediately tried to connect with their students. Steve, even before some of our educators could connect virtually because either the devices weren't in all the kids' hands or whatever, right? Our educators, you saw those pictures, were driving in their cars yeah. through the neighborhoods where they knew that their students were talking to them from the end of the driveway or from their cars, giving other assignments and or delivering. We had bus drivers and our custodians delivering some of the devices because if you remember, they came in, you know, the districts ordered them. They came in at all different times. That's right. You went house to house to deliver. How much of that is about innovation, adapting? How much of that is that? You said the will, the will matters. Yeah. But I'm obsessed with this innovation, adapting, and this is an expression I have. I won't get on my soapbox, soapbox, but the status quo is never, ever an option. You respond how? 100% agree with you. But I would also say that in my profession, that is what I'm trained to do. There are no two students ever in my class that are the same. And so I have a core set of information that I know I have to deliver. It is up to me to figure out how to deliver it. It's not any one way. That is my responsibility to make sure that if I deliver a lesson or a concept in any one way, I assess whether that student has received it and he or she hasn't. I have to immediately switch my game plan. I have to have what I used to call my bag of tricks and go, mm, I'm looking at this kid's face. He's not getting it. Let me try rephrasing it. Let me, let me try another method. And sometimes those methods, by the way, are presenting a concept and facilitating an idea and then matching that student up with another student. Sometimes student to student wow. can help, which going back to challenges that we have going from in-person to the, you know, the Zoom meetings, uh, it's a little more tricky as you to can- To match them back. up. But, yeah. but, but, yeah. but are you, two things. Number one, that, that is teacher to me as leader. So do you agree that teachers are leading every day? 100%, right? yeah. Do you also agree they're innovating every day? Yeah. But here's the other follow-up. My final question is this. The Learning Live initiative, which was a collaboration, if I get this wrong, tell me, uh, between the New Jersey Education Association, our great public television station in New Jersey, uh, NJTV, with the parent, WNET, and our president, Neil Shapiro, the Department of Education in New Jersey, those are the players, right? Correct, yep. Okay, so this is a Learning Alive initiative where early on in the pandemic, you're having your teachers do learning, not just for their students, but for any students who logs on on NJTV or on a computer or on their television. That's innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And we With were a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, corrections and a lot of, is that part of innovation as well? Again, I'll get off my soapbox, but is part of innovation learning from all those mistakes? I don't want to call them mistakes, but things we learn as things don't go right. Yeah, no, and they are mistakes. And who was it? Was it Einstein that said that if he hadn't made mistakes, he wouldn't have gotten anywhere? And uh, certainly um, uh, any of the big name innovators in the well. country, they've all said the same thing. They'll make a thousand mistakes before they get it right. And so mistakes are part of innovation and success? It, yeah, absolutely. And isn't that why they used to tell me, that's why there's an eraser on that pencil, Marie. <laughs> and, and the fun, biggest takeaway that you want to share with our audience about teaching, teachers, learning, and innovation. Final words. It is a fabulous opportunity and a career for someone to be on this earth and to be able to affect lives for the future for the better. Huge responsibility, but geez, 
can't be any better than that, Steve. Yeah. As I said, teachers are not just great leaders. They're extraordinary individuals. Hey, Marie, thanks so much, my friend. Thank you, Steve. That was Marie Bliston, who leads the New Jersey Education Association. Mary, real quick, um, how much gratitude do you have for public school teachers? Oh, I tell you, I mean, Marie really was talking about innovation and just pivoting and just the hard work of the public. I always said that I, I mean, uh, teachers, as a general rule, even before COVID, they are just doing a tremendous amount of work, both in school and out of school. And now with COVID, trying to adapt and trying to teach students in the classroom and then remotely. And then are we in school today? Are we not in school today? It's just amazing how they are doing the best that they can. It's, it's got to be challenging. If, we, if teachers are not leaders, I don't know who the leaders are because they are leaders. Hey, Mary, real quick on gratitude before we wrap up the show. First of all, I am always telling you, never enough, how much gratitude I feel for what you do for our organization, what you've done for me professionally and personally, and I greatly appreciate it. And we're always, one, by the way, one of the ways you have to show Mary gratitude is, I want to say this, she is the best negotiator for bonuses at the end of the year and a raise that anyone I've ever met. And I've said this before, early on, she was terrible and I loved it because she couldn't ask for a raise or for a bonus without getting rashy and red mm -hmm. and uncomfortable. And now she's like, this is what I need. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, so a lot memory, of that. Memory, I really appreciate you and I'm thanking you. And she goes, no, I need the money. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what I've always said. Yeah. Show me the money. Right. Jerry Maguire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cuba Gooding was right. Show me. So, Mary, here's the question. We show our gratitude as leaders. Is it with money? It, it definitely helps. And a, a lot of different things. So with gratitude, of course, the great job, the attaboy, the keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, I really like what you did last week uh, on this or that. Um, perfect example, uh, Laura Van Bloom on our team uh, with our Caucus Educational Corporation programming. Uh, we had a couple of successful meetings recently and we went in and and one of them, one of the uh, one of our underwriters was saying just how great and how much they appreciate the communication that they get year round from our team, That's letting Laura. them know that, yeah, and exactly. And that's Laura. But she took a moment yesterday to send an email to the team saying, listen, this is what uh, so-and-so said. And I want to let all of you know how much we appreciate the input that you give me. So I'm able to give these updates to our underwriters. And just that little bit of gratitude, a little email, a little text, a, a pick up the phone, especially in today's day and age, pick up the phone and call and say, you want to know what you're doing a good job. And, and, and then of course, money. Yes, money definitely helps tremendously. <laughs> But money alone won't get it done. And no. thank you alone, frankly, won't get it done. But in these difficult economic times, Mary and I, Mary manages the budget of our not-for-profit organization, the Caucus Educational Corporation, and our company, Stand and Deliver. By the way, check out our website. You'll see it up. Sylvester will put it up, stand-deliver.com. She manages the business. I'm out there doing this. I'm out there trying to cut deals, if you will, for sponsors and whatever else, trying to be innovative and imaginative. But Mary runs the business. Mary handles the nuts and bolts every day, and she's innovative and creative. But Mary, thank you enough won't get it done, even in hard economic times. Um, and money alone won't get it done. And finally, real quick, we talked about teachers. We've got 30 seconds left. And by the way, thank you to Elvin. Thank you to Frank. Thank you to Scarlin over here behind the camera. Um, Elvin, and who then, directs the show. Frank yep. is an extraordinary audio engineer. Mary, you want to thank anyone else? You yeah, I would love to. I would love to thank Sylvester, who uh, does all of our editing, and Amy, who does all of our closed captioning, uh, who just, they're always there to just help to be the checks and balances and make sure that our program looks great uh, every Sunday on News 12 Plus, followed by Think Tank at 1030 a.m. on News 12 Plus. So keep watching for some more uh, Steve Adubato after this. We're, we're going to change the name from Lessons in Leadership with Steve and Mary to thank you. Thank you. And thank Gratitude. you, Steve. I do. I do appreciate you. I'm going to say no. it publicly. I'm no. saying it publicly. No, I, I'm saying go. it publicly. Not thank enough. You, I need money. We'll see you I next I appreciate week. you. <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Gibbons PC, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague Mary Gamba has been provided by NJ On Air. CIANJ and Commerce Magazine.